I work in the mental health field, and part of my job used to be supervising intern psychologists. One Friday years ago, I was at the end of my shift, and I got a call from one of the interns telling me that one of her patients walked in without an appointment. She said he was acting strangely, and she was afraid he was becoming psychotic and may need to be hospitalized. She asked me to meet with him and then discuss his condition with her. So I called my own boss, just in case we needed backup, and I told my intern to bring her patient to my boss's office and we could all meet together. The patient walked in pushing a toy baby stroller with a baby doll strapped in it. The patient was a six-foot-two, middle-aged black man, so needless to say I could understand why the intern was a little concerned. We invited him to sit down, and we all settled in for a nice chat. I turned to the patient, exchanged a few pleasantries, then said, Can you tell me why you've brought Shaniqua with you here today? and pointed towards the doll. The guy's face fell. He asked me where I got that name. I said, Well, you must have just told it to me. He said, No, I didn't. I then turned to my intern and said, Well, then she must have told me the name. But my intern said, I've never heard that name before in my life. I turned back to the patient and he took a deep breath and sighed. He then went on to explain that he had a daughter years ago, and she died in infancy. Her name was Shaniqua. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. We decided not to hospitalize the man, and we all went home. The next day, when I spoke to the intern, she said she reviewed all of her notes, and the patient had never mentioned that name nor had he even revealed that he had a daughter who died until the previous night. It still gives me chills to this day. I was hanging out in the dorms with my college friend. The walls were thin and you could hear people in the other rooms. We were watching a movie, and the guy in the next room had his TV on louder than usual. Eventually, we got mad, knocked on the wall, and asked him to turn it down. The volume went down for about three seconds. Then, it turned up even louder than before. We thought he was being a dick, and we banged on the wall again, yelling for him to turn it down. But the volume went up even louder again when we did that. Now we were mad, so we went into the hallway to knock on his door and confront him. As we were standing in front of his door, we saw the guy that lived in the room walking towards us down the hall from the elevator. The second we saw him, the TV in his room went off completely and fell silent. Thoroughly confused, we asked him if he had someone staying in his room. He said no. We told him what was going on, and he unlocked the door. We were prepared to fight whoever had broken into his room. No one was inside, but we found all of his desk drawers and the closet door wide open. Now this was on the fourth floor, so nobody could have escaped out the window, and all three of us were standing in the hallway by the door, and no one had left the room. We all slept in the common room that night, with the lights on. When I was young, I was visiting my grandparents in New York. They had me sleep in a bedroom that had four dolls, one in each corner, facing towards the center of the room. Now, I'm afraid of dolls. I don't know why, but I've never liked them. They always scared me. So I turned all four of the dolls around to face the wall so they weren't staring at me. I woke up thirsty in the night and went downstairs to get a glass of water. Halfway down the stairs, I heard a creaking sound. Walking a few steps further down the stairs, I saw a rocking chair going back and forth with no one in it. It was a constant movement, too, not a slowing down as if someone had just gotten up. 
It kept going back and forth, as if someone were rocking in it. I decided I really didn't need that glass of water after all, and ran back upstairs into my room, only to find all four of the dolls were turned around again and were now facing the center of the room and me. I grabbed the blankets off my bed, ran into the bathroom, and spent the night in the tub. A friend of mine worked the graveyard shift, doing security for the Terrell Insane Asylum in East Texas. His stories about that place are legendary, and this is one of my favorites. It happened shortly after he took the job. The asylum is on a campus and consists of quite a few buildings. While driving through the campus on the overnight shift, he approached one of the original and oldest buildings on the property. The building had long since been retired as a hospital ward and was being used only for storage of old medical equipment. He noticed a light was on in one of the upper rooms and figured it must have been carelessly left on by one of the staff earlier in the day while they were storing some equipment. He entered the building, walked up the four flights, and saw the light at the end of the hall. As he walked down the hallway towards the room, he did the usual security protocol of jiggling the handles of all the doors that he passed to make sure they were locked. He finally reached the room, entered it, and saw nothing out of place, so he flipped the light off, shut the door, and locked it. But when he turned around to walk back down the long hallway, he froze. Every door that he had just made sure were locked and secured were now standing wide open. No lights were on, and everything was silent, but all of the doors were wide open. Well, he noped it out of there as fast as he could, and once he was outside and back in the security van, he turned around to see that the fourth floor light was on once again. When my wife and I first got married, we moved in with her grandmother to help take care of her after her husband died. She was diabetic and had already lost one leg to amputation and needed a walker to get around. Our bedroom was on one side of the hallway bathroom and her grandmother's was on the other side. One night we were lying in bed and we heard her grandmother's door open, then the sound of somebody walking to the bathroom but it sounded like they were walking on two legs, no walker. Her walker made a very distinct sound on the hardwood floors, and we hadn't heard it. But we did hear the sound of somebody walking on two feet. The bathroom light went on, and I could see a shadow of two legs under the door. But there was no sound, no running water, no moving around, no toilet flushing. Then the light clicked off, and I heard the door open again. But no one was there when we looked, and her grandmother was in bed, asleep. Another time in that house, our nine-month-old child was in his crib, going down for a nap. My wife put a wind-up musical toy clown in the crib with him, because he liked the soothing music. Then she went out to the kitchen with the baby monitor, so she could hear him as she worked. As soon as she got to the kitchen, the music stopped, and she heard our son cooing like he was interacting with someone. My wife went in to make sure that everything was okay, and when she walked in, she found the clown standing up on the dresser on the other side of the room, as if someone took it out of his crib and placed it there. But no one else was at home. We spoke to our other family members about this, and most of them had stories to tell. All of this seemed to have started after my wife's grandfather died. One story involved a musical Christmas ornament that her grandfather hated. He would always turn the volume way down, and her grandmother would go and turn it right back up again. It was a constant battle between the two of them. After his death, her grandmother had that ornament on the tree turned up loud as usual. She was in the kitchen when the sound got quieter. She went to see if the batteries were dead, 
but they were working just fine. That whole night, she turned the volume up, and as soon as she got back into the kitchen, the volume went down again, just like Grandpa used to do. Here's a final story. One of Grandma's daughters picked her up to take her out to lunch. When they returned home, there was a bowl in the kitchen strainer that had obviously just been washed and left to dry. And the entire house smelled like chili, which was her grandfather's favorite meal. No one was home, and no one had cooked any chili. I think Grandpa's still around. When I was 19, I was in a very emotionally abusive relationship with a girlfriend that I lived with. She isolated me by basically forcing me to cut ties with all my family and friends. Then, she systematically drove my self-esteem into the ground. On Halloween night in 2010, around 11 p.m., I came very close to committing suicide because of it all. The only thing that stopped me was that I couldn't find the shotgun shells. It wasn't until months later, after leaving her and reconciling with my parents, that I heard this story. On Halloween that year, both of my parents randomly woke up at 11 p.m. and had a strong feeling that something was terribly wrong with me. So they went downstairs to my old bedroom to pray for me. But when they entered the room, they both felt a dark, heavy presence inside. They both said that it felt malicious. It was so strong that my mom couldn't even stay in the room, so my dad went in alone, and he prayed for my well-being for over an hour until the dark presence left. I had entertained suicidal thoughts for over an hour that night, until the thoughts just left me. It seems that, somehow, my parents' connection to me was so strong that they were able to help me forget about killing myself, even from 50 miles away. I can't explain it, and I don't think I really need to. In high school, I met a friend that ended up coming down with leukemia. It ravaged his body and was a terrible thing to witness. One night around 10 p.m., I got a call from his mother to please come over. She said she thought he may die that night. I was only 16 years old, and I had no experience of having someone close to me die. But I really wanted to be there to comfort my friend, so I went. It was really hard seeing him that way. He had wasted away to only 75 pounds, couldn't talk, and was full of painkillers. He looked helpless. I stayed in his room talking to him, trying to make him laugh, but I couldn't. It was the most brutal and heartbreaking thing that I've ever seen, and I can't even imagine what he was going through. That night when I went home, I had the most vivid dream I've ever had in my life. I was in front of our old high school in Florida, and it looked like it had just been through a hurricane. There were trees uprooted, houses were destroyed, and there was debris strewn everywhere on the street. But the sky was blue, and the sun was beautiful and shining. It was the calm after the storm. I walked through all of the destruction, and I ended up at the local convenience store, where all us kids hang out after school. There I saw my friend, sitting on the curb in front of the store. I was stunned, because he didn't look sick at all. In fact, he looked a picture of health. I said, Sean, what are you doing here? He smiled brightly and said, I just wanted to tell you I'm okay. Everything's fine. I'm happy. I was so confused. How is it that you got better so fast? Sean said nothing. He just sat there smiling and turned his face to the sun. When I woke up the next morning, that dream was still in my mind. 
I went to the kitchen and I saw my mom. She told me that about an hour after I left Sean the previous night, he passed away. I feel he came to me in that dream, letting me know he was okay to put my mind at ease. He was trying to make me feel better, just as I tried to do for him before he died. I believe the debris from the hurricane and the calm after the storm was a metaphor for what he went through down here and where he is now. It was a very comforting dream, but I still miss him a lot. About five or six years ago, I was on a business trip to Tennessee. I was driving in, and I was still about an hour away from my destination. It was late, and I was exhausted, so I found a roadside hotel and pulled in. I intended to spend the night, get some sleep, and start fresh in the morning. I went inside and asked if there was an available room. The owner said, Yes, of course. It's just me, the hotel manager, and all the ghosts here. The place is pretty haunted, but they're nice ghosts. I was a little taken aback, but I was exhausted, so I said, Uh, okay, they're nice. No weird stuff, right? To which he responded, Well, stuff will happen, but most likely nothing bad. I was so tired, I just said, Whatever, give me a room. To be fair, the place actually looked pretty cool from the outside. It's a really old building, and it was right next to the train tracks. I loved the architecture of old buildings, so I was fine with it. The owner showed me up to the second floor, where my room was located. As soon as I set foot up there, though, I got this sinking feeling, like this was a really bad idea and I should just leave. But I was exhausted and not fit to drive, so I continued on. The hallway itself was like something straight out of a horror movie. It seemed to go on without end. The hallway actually seemed longer than the building, if that makes any sense. It was creepy as hell. The owner then introduced me to the hotel manager, who just happened to be up on the floor. He told me she'd be the only other person staying in the hotel that night, since he stays in another building. He joked that there were just too many ghosts in this building for his taste, and then said goodnight. Okay, whatever. My room was pretty standard, nothing special. It was facing the front of the hotel with a window overlooking the train tracks. But I really didn't care what the room looked like. I was so tired that within minutes of lying down, I was out cold. I have no idea how much time passed, but suddenly the sound of a train woke me up, and I realized that I was completely paralyzed. Something was holding me down. I was pinned to the bed so tight I couldn't move. It was horrifying. I was trying so hard to move and fight this thing off of me, but I could barely do anything. After about ten minutes or so, when I finally gave up fighting and went limp, the thing let go. I jumped up out of bed freaking out, wondering what the hell just happened. By that time it was past midnight, so I decided to just sit in a chair, turn on the TV and stay up all night. Forget about sleeping. Hours later, I heard another train go by. And as it did, right outside my door, I heard the sound of glasses clanking loudly like someone was carrying a tray of glasses down the hall, but only from my door to where the headboard of my bed was. Back and forth, back and forth, again and again, clank, 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 right outside my door. This went on for about a minute straight, then I went and opened the door, and as soon as I opened the door, everything went silent. An unnatural silence. No one was out there. I went back and sat down on the chair and thought, Okay, what's going to happen next? Before I could even finish that thought, the TV picture started getting all weird and wavy. It was now around 6 a.m., 
and I was still sitting in that chair, wide awake. Just then, I heard the disembodied voice of a little girl say right in my ear, There's somebody in the chair. I looked up, and there was a shadow figure of a really tall man wearing a hat, rising up out of the other chair across the room. I blinked, opened my eyes, and he was gone. Well, that was it. I grabbed my stuff, packed it up, and left as fast as I could. I went down to the lobby, freaking out. The owner was there, starting his workday, and he asked me what was wrong. I told him what happened, and he calmly replied, Oh yeah, a little girl died in your room. She fell out of the window while waiting for her daddy to come home on the train. I looked at him and said, Why, out of all the empty rooms in the entire place, would you put me in that room? He looked at me and said, Well, it has the best view. Now mind you, I arrived after dark, and let him know I was leaving first thing in the morning, and the view from the window was of the train tracks. Awesome hospitality, not so awesome intelligence. So I started ranting, telling him that all this talk about nice ghosts was a bunch of crap. They may not have hurt me, but my God, did they scare me. Then he tells me that just like there are good and bad people, there are good and bad ghosts, and that none of the bad ghosts would ever hurt anyone in the hotel because his wife would protect them. I asked where his wife was, and he said, Oh, she's dead. I was thinking to myself, Dude, you're crazy. He then proceeds to tell me the story about his wife. She died of cancer, and she made him a promise that if there was any way to stick around after death, She'd find it, and she'd watch over the place and anyone who stayed there forever. After she died, he named one of the rooms after her, and on her birthday, he had some ghost hunters come out to try to communicate with her. They all went into the room named after her, and he wished her a happy birthday. He told her he hoped she knows how much he loved her and really missed her. One of the ghost hunters said out loud, if there's anything you want to tell him, now's the time. Later on, while listening back to the tape, they heard a woman's voice say, Tell him I know. I actually thought that was pretty sweet. But then I asked him about that thing that held me down to the bed. He told me that he had no idea who or what it was, but apparently I got off easy. He told me the first time he stayed in that room... He actually got bruised and cut and sprained his arm because he fought it so hard. The night in that hotel was the most scared I've ever been in my life, and it made me a true believer in the afterlife without a doubt, especially after hearing that little girl's voice. In high school, my girlfriend and I were on the ROTC rifle team. We'd stay after school until 7 p.m., practicing our marksmanship in the school basement. After practice every night, her mom would pick us up in the parking lot outside the band room, which was also in the basement and connected to the ROTC offices. So we would hang around the band room looking out the window, waiting for her. The night this happened, it was winter, so it was cold outside and dark because it was after 7 the whole building was empty, except for us and our sergeant major, a retired Vietnam vet who was and still is the bravest badass I've ever met. So my girlfriend and I were in the band room waiting for her mom, and the sergeant major was in his office. It was quiet, and we were standing there for a good 15 minutes alone, just talking, when suddenly, out of nowhere, a huge set of double tubular bells started shaking violently, making all kinds of noise. They were about five feet away from me, and they must have weighed well over 300 pounds because they were a double set made of brass and steel. 
Suddenly, they shot across the room, flipping over end to end about three or four times. It was like someone had picked them up and thrown them, as if they weighed nothing. I tore out of there as fast as I physically could, working on pure adrenaline. I left my girlfriend to fend for herself. No chivalry there. I was just too scared. I didn't say, Are you okay? Did you see that? No. Just whoosh, and I was gone. I ran to the sergeant major's office, and before I could get one word out of my mouth, my girlfriend was there beside me, crying her eyes out. We both explained to the sergeant what happened, and he kept telling us to just calm down. Then he walked with us back to the band room to check things out. And sure enough, the 300-pound bells were now on the floor on the opposite side from where they had just been. The sergeant major didn't say anything. He just took us back to his office and told us to wait with him until my girlfriend's mother came. Try as I might, I can't figure out how that happened. It wasn't a prank. There were no other people in the building. And I highly doubt anyone could lift a set of 300-pound bells much less throw them across the room end to end. This happened to me over 20 years ago, and I've been searching for a legitimate explanation ever since. And I have yet to find one. Last winter, I kept having horrible night terrors with a side of sleep paralysis. I'm talking four or five times a week. I'd wake my boyfriend up by thrashing around and trying to scream. It would always start the same way. It felt like my body was humming, as if there were electricity running through my veins, and I was unable to move or speak. Even worse, during these episodes, it always felt like there was some kind of evil presence in the room. It would talk to me in my head, and it had a really scary voice. This was so real that once I was able to move again, I'd wake my boyfriend up and we'd go through the entire house looking for, well, monsters for lack of a better word. Of course, we never found anything. This bothered me so much that I turned to the internet for some answers. I wanted to know how to make it stop. I found two suggestions that seemed easy and doable. One was to slowly try moving a finger or a toe, just enough to wake yourself up. And the other was to calmly talk to yourself in your head, again, until you were able to wake yourself up. Well, that night it happened again. My body was humming with electricity, but I hadn't yet felt the presence of evil in the room. I immediately started trying to wiggle my fingers, while at the same time singing to myself in my head. Now I'm a mom of a four-year-old. She was three at the time, and the only song I could think of was, If You're Happy and You Know It. So there I was, trying to stay calm and wake myself up by singing a children's song in my head, when that feeling of the evil presence entered the room. Now I was desperately trying to wake myself up, but I just couldn't seem to do it. So I started repeating to myself in my head, It's not real. It's not real. You're just dreaming this is not real. That's when I heard the thing say to me, Oh yeah? Watch this. Literally two seconds later, my then three-year-old daughter started screaming in the next room. My boyfriend jumped out of bed and ran to her. She was crying and said, did you see what Grandma just did? She said her grandma showed up out of nowhere and in a loud, scary voice started screaming in her face. Mind you, this all happened mere seconds after that thing told me to watch this if I thought it wasn't real. And my daughter's grandma lives in another state. No one was in her room, let alone her grandmother. I didn't get much sleep that night nor for the next few weeks. In fact, it took me months to be able to sleep through the night again. I've had a few other episodes since then, but none of them as horrifying as that one.
The house I grew up in was built in the 1800s, and the basement door that's located in the kitchen needs a skeleton key. There'd been some break-ins in the neighborhood, and it would be pretty easy to break into our basement then come up into the main part of the house, so we kept that door locked at all times. One night my parents were out and I was home alone. I locked the basement door and kept the key on a chain around my neck. I was up in my room doing homework and I wanted a soda, so I walked down the stairs to the kitchen, only to find the basement door wide open. I froze, thinking that someone had broken in. But then I realized that no one could be in the house because the floorboards squeaked so badly. If anyone had walked up those stairs, I'd have heard them, and I hadn't heard a thing. So I closed and locked the door again, and I pulled on the handle to make sure it was secure, and went back to my room. As soon as I sat down, I realized I'd forgotten to get my soda, so I went back down to the kitchen, only to find the basement door open once again. Now I knew I'd locked at that time, so I was wondering what was going on but I wasn't scared. I just locked it again, made sure it was secured, and turned to get my soda from the fridge, which was about three feet away. When I closed the refrigerator and turned around, the basement door was wide open again. I hadn't heard a thing. I stood there for a moment in shock. Then slowly and warily, I approached the door to close it and lock it yet again. But this time, when I closed it, something slammed against it hard from the other side. So hard that the door vibrated. That was all I needed. I ran upstairs and locked myself in the bedroom. A few days later, I told my dad what happened. All he did was look at me and say, Why do you think I moved my workbench from the basement to the garage? I'd like to thank my family of darkness for listening tonight. While I'm no longer on a set schedule, I will be posting longer videos with live chat from time to time, and in between, I'll be posting shorts. So be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Though, as usual, YouTube often drops the ball when it comes to sending out the notifications. So you might want to just check out my channel page from time to time. You don't want to miss out on the fun. So now, until next time, stay scared, my friends.